how important are qualifications. Let's suppose that in the morning you're scheduled to have surgery and I come in. And you say, oh, you're, you're here to pray with me. No, I'm here to do the surgery. <laughs> you say, but, but, but aren't you a preacher? Yeah, I, I, I'm a preacher. I, I've been to the seminary. I have pastoral experience. I have degrees. But see this scalpel? I'm going to do your surgery. It'll be, it'll be fine, really. Don't worry about it. It'll be fine. Well, have, have, did you go to medical school? No, but it'll be fine. Well, do you have any experience? Well, I, 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 I dissected a worm in ninth grade biology. <laughs> but really, everything will be fine. No, you say, no, you don't have the qualifications for that. You are not doing that. Qualifications matter. We want our mechanics to be qualified. We want our plumbers to be qualified, our doctors, our law. Qualifications matter. What is it that qualifies Jesus to be our great high priest? Open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 5. I've avoided this text for a couple of weeks, but we're going to look at it today. That is our great high priest. Would you agree with me this morning that our weaknesses our sins, our frailty demands that we have someone in heaven who represents us. Let's stand together and honor the reading of God's Word from the book of Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 1. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, but that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but that it said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. And he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned by obedience the things which he had suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Father, we bow in your presence today, and Lord, our hearts are made to rejoice by the songs that we have sung from our hearts to yours. We thank you for the hope that is in Christ. We thank you for the victory that is in Jesus and the grace that you've abundantly bestowed upon our lives. We pray now, Father, for the spiritual discipline to hear and receive your word into our hearts. Father, we pray that if there's one in this service today who, for whatever reason, has never acknowledged their sin and their need of salvation, they've never put their trust in Christ, we pray, Lord, that today as the Spirit of God convicts them They will call upon Christ's name and be saved. May you be the object of our worship and our adoration today. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you and you may be seated. The writer of Hebrews is writing to people who are suffering and they're hurting. Uh, And they're not hurting because they are violators of the law. They are hurting because they have received Christ as their Savior. There's physical persecution where they are actually being persecuted and Physical harm is coming to them because of their faith in Christ. They're hurting emotionally because their faith in Christ now meant that they had severed family ties. Their families no longer had any fellowship with them all because they believed in Christ. As a result of the physical persecution, the emotional stress and 
turmoil. Many of them were thinking about turning back the, from stop following Jesus and they were going to go back to the temple, go back to Judaism, go back to the sacrificial system. And the writer writes to tell them that Jesus is better. He is better in his person. He is better than the angels. He is better than Moses. He is better than the prophets. Jesus Christ is better. By the way, let me say it again. You take whatever you want to take. You name anybody you want to name. You name an institution. You name a system. You name a philosophy. And Jesus Christ is always better. Now he comes to this section of Hebrews to tell us that Christ is not only better in his person, but Christ is also better in his priesthood. Why does Jesus, why is Jesus the perfect high priest? He gives us three reasons in our text, or two reasons in our text. He does a contrast between the earthly priest and the heavenly priest. Notice first of all what he says about the earthly priest for every high priest taken from among men. Let me pause there and say that it has to be a man. God's economy involved a man. It was a man that would represent the people before God. It was a man who would offer up sacrifices on their behalf to God. It was a man. It was not an angel. An angel couldn't experience our weaknesses. An angel cannot enter in to our sorrows and suffering. So he says, number one, it has to be a man. Number two, he has to be ordained of God. That is, a man could not, uh, a boy could not grow up and think, you know what, when I get to be a man, I'm going to be a priest. It didn't work that way. He had to be ordained of God. He had to be of the tribe of Levi. And then he had to be of Aaronic descent if he was to be a high priest. He had to be ordained of God. You didn't assume the office. You were appointed to the office and you were appointed by God. Let me ask you a question. Did God have the right to appoint whomsoever he willed to that office? You answered in the, in the affirmative, I think, so just tuck that away because we're going to come back to it. So he says this priest was ordained of God and he dealt with the things that pertain to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. I do not believe there is a huge difference between sacrifices and sins. It is, it is uh, the, the gifts were cereal offerings. They were grain offerings offerings and and sacrifices were animals so here is the priest day after day he put on his priestly apron and at the end of the day every day it was always stained with blood there was a sin problem so day after day he stood and made sacrifices for sins in fact this book says that he stood daily making sacrifices for sins but not only was he making sacrifices for sins verse 2 says who can have compassion on the ignorant that is not the usual word for compassion it is used only here in the Bible he has compassion it is compassion but it is tempered with justice it is not that the, that the high priest would just merely enter into the suffering and the sorrow of the people but he always tempered it with justice the law of God had to be satisfied sin could not be compromised but because he was a man he had compassion on the ignorant but watch this because he himself was compassed with infirmities so he offered up he offered up sacrifices for himself. Verse 3 says that he offered up sacrifices for himself. You see, this high priest was a sinner. This high priest knew what it was to be tempted. He knew what it was to succumb to temptation. He knew what it was that, that he had a need in his heart and in his life that he had to offer a sacrifice to God. On the Day of Atonement, the biggest day on the Jewish calendar, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would slaughter an animal. He would go into the holy of holies. And don't you know he went with fear and trepidation 
Don't you know because God was going to show up in that little cubicle that he was fearful, that he was frightful, and he had his blood gathered from the, that animal and uh, he would carry it in and he would splash it upon the Ark of the Covenant and out he went. But before that could be done, you know what the high priest had to do? He had to stop at the laver and there he had to ceremonially wash himself and by washing himself he was confessing, I too am a sinner. But that wasn't enough. Then he had to offer up a sin offering. So he ceremonially washed himself. He's offered up a sin offering, but that's not enough. Then he would offer up a whole burnt offering. All of that was saying, I'm a sinner. I'm a man of flesh and bones like you. I have trials, temptations. I have proclivities to sin. He was acknowledging his sin. In fact, if you look in chapter 7 uh, quickly, look in this same book, chapter 7 and verse 27. It says that Jesus not, needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice for his own sins and then for the people. For this he did once when he offered himself. Now I want to tell you why Jesus is the perfect high priest. Every other high priest, Annas, Caiaphas, every other high priest had sin in their heart. They had sin in their life. But Jesus Christ knew no sin and became the payment for our sins. I want you to think about it a moment. I want you to think this morning, who is seated at the right hand of God? When you have a burden, when you have a trial, when you have a need, who is it that is there that is interceding for you? Who, who has the ear of God this morning? The very one who came down from heaven, assumed his place on the cross, and was judged to be sin for you. He is at the right hand of God this morning for you. That's the earthly priest. He's a sinner. He has infirmities. That's the earthly priest. He has weaknesses just like we do. That is the earthly priest. He has limitations just like we do. But I want to move from the earthly priest to the heavenly high priest. Look what he says in verse 5, so also here is the high priest, he's been appointed by God, Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, that is he did not he did not capriciously assume the role of high priest, he didn't say you know what one of these days I'm going to be a high priest, but he was appointed by God now this is wrought with problems if we don't understand the scriptures Jesus was of what tribe? Judah. That was the kingly tribe. To be a priest, uh, you had to be of the tribe of Levi. To be a high priest, you had to be of Aaronic descent. Jesus was not of Aaronic descent. Jesus was not of the tribe of Levi. So how did all of this come about? And by the way, I read recently that there are some Jews that believe there will be two messiahs. One, they believe the messiah will be prophet, priest, and king. One of the messiahs will be of Judah so that he can be a king. The other messiah, they say, will be of uh, Levi so he can be a priest. Therefore, they say one man cannot fit both descriptions priest and king they're only ignorant of their own history because look what he says that he's going to be a priest after the order you see it in verse 6 he's going to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek now who in the world is that I bet you've gone all week and not even thought about Melchizedek one time you probably don't sit around the Thanksgiving table and say hey y'all let's talk about Melchizedek we don't think about Melchizedek. In fact, who was he? He's only, he's only mentioned two times in the Bible. He's only mentioned two times in the Bible, and it is when Abraham has gone and rescued his backslidden nephew, Lot. And you know what the Bible says about Melchizedek? 
The Bible says that he was the king of Salem. Salem is an obvious reference to Jerusalem. And he was the king of Salem. And then the Bible says something. He blessed Abraham. And Abraham paid tithes unto Melchizedek. You know what the point of that is? The point is that before the giving of the law of Moses, before there was a priest from Levi, before there was a high priest of the descent of Aaron, there was a priest who was neither a Levite, who was not of Judah, but he was a king priest, and he was a king priest because God made him to be a king priest. God can call and qualify whomsoever he will. I just want to remind you this morning, God is God. And if God wants a priest that is not of Levi, and God wants a king that's not of Judah, God can do it because God is sovereign. He's not bound by what we think. He doesn't do things the way we think they ought to be done. God is God. I often make this statement, there is a God and it's not you. We don't dictate to God. We don't determine what God, what God is going to do. Now notice what he says, that, that, that Christ is a priest forever. Don't lightly pass over those words. He is a priest forever. He is a priest forever. Hey, do you remember when, do you, remember when you met uh, Caiaphas? You remember that day when you were introduced to Caiaphas? Oh, here's somebody I want you to meet. I want you to meet Caiaphas. He's the high priest. Well, maybe you don't remember that, but do you remember when you met Annas? Somebody introduced you to Annas and they said, I, I want you to meet Mr. Annas. Annas is the high priest of Israel. Do you remember that? No, you don't remember that. And I'm going to tell you why. Because Caiaphas is dead. Annas is dead. But do you remember the day when somebody said, I want to introduce you to Jesus. I want you to know Jesus because Jesus Christ is alive. Our great high priest is not in a Judean tomb. Our great high priest is not rotting in a grave. Our great high priest is alive, seated at the right hand of the majesty on high, making intercession for us. That is who our great high priest is. Watch, watch what he, how he describes him who in, the, in verse 7. Who in the days of his flesh, that's the days of his humanity. The days of his flesh, his personal ministry on earth. He offered up prayers and supplications with strong cryings and tears. I want to take you to two places this morning. First of all, I want you to go with me to Gethsemane. I want you to go to dark. Gethsemane there our Lord is with his band of disciples and then he takes his three and most disciples further into the garden the soft gentle southern wind is blowing upon the cheeks of Jesus and he says to those three and most disciples watch and pray while I go yonder and pray and the Bible says that he went about a stone's throw away and he fell on his face and he began to pray all that we have in the gospel accounts is this. It comes from the gospel of Luke. And while our Lord was in the garden of Gethsemane, while he was in the garden of Gethsemane, he prayed so fervently. He prayed so passionately that the capillaries in his, in his skin erupted and he began to sweat as it were great drops of blood. Our Lord in the throes of agony and sorrow. Our Lord grappling with the issues of life and death and eternity. Prayed so fervently. And the, the emotion of our Lord comes out. We come to the book of Hebrews. He had something we didn't know. We didn't know this took place. But the Bible says that he offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him. You ever heard anybody pray like that? You ever heard anybody pray with strong crying and tears? I've heard it. When the anguish of the soul is so pronounced, the only way a prayer can come out is with strong crying and tears. 
There's our Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane. Hours before the cross, the shadow of the cross has fallen against his sinless life. He'll soon be facing bloody Calvary. And in the agony of Gethsemane, our Lord prayed, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Some would say that Jesus was praying that God wouldn't make him go to the cross. Let me show you why that's not true. He prayed unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. You want to tell me that the prayer of Jesus wasn't heard? No. He said on one occasion, I thank thee, Father, that thou always hearest me when I pray. He heard him. In the Garden of Gethsemane, what was taking place as our Lord prayed, let this cup pass from me. What were the contents of the cup? In the contents of that cup in the Garden of Gethsemane, there were the dregs of humanity. There were the dregs of sin. There was the the separation from God that would surely come at the cross. You see, Christ suffered on the cross physically, spiritually, and emotionally. And our Lord knew there would come a moment of separation. He prayed to him who is able to deliver from death. You say, well, I guess the Lord didn't hear him because Jesus died, didn't he? Oh, yeah, Jesus died. That is true. But let me tell you, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is praying to him that has the power to deliver from death. Jesus would then go to, would soon be arrested, go to the cross, lay down his life for the sins of the world, and God would judge him to be sin for us. He would be stricken and smitten of God. That's an aspect of the cross. We don't understand how that God's own son could be smitten and stricken of God, but our sin demands. It. My sin, your sin, demanded that God pour out his wrath on the head of his only begotten son. He prayed to him who had the power to deliver from death. They took the, begged for the body of Jesus, took the lifeless body of Jesus down from the cross. And he prayed to him who had power to deliver from death and he heard him. Three days later, the earth began to quake. The rocks gave way. The stone was rolled back. And Jesus Christ got up from the dead to live forevermore. We have a high priest that is alive. We have a high priest who has conquered death. We have a high priest that has conquered the grave. He's seated at the right hand of God. This very moment, this very second, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. I wouldn't be surprised if just before this service, Jesus leaned over and said to the Father, help Copeland preach this morning. He sure does need it. He's interceding on our behalf. But notice verse 8. We move now from dark Gethsemane to Calvary. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. It is not that Christ had been disobedient, it is, it, is, it is not that somehow he was disobedient, but now he is obedient. But, but in the humanity of our Lord, in that dichotomy, he is man, he is God, he is the perfect God-man. There were some things that Jesus learned. He became equipped through the process of learning and being made perfect. Not that he was ever morally imperfect, but he became fully qualified and the author of eternal salvation. Let me show you what happened. Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, prays fervently and passionately till he begins to sweat, as it were, great drops of blood, goes to Calvary, suffers at the hands of men, suffers at the hands of God. But look what it says in verse 9. He became the author of eternal salvation. I don't know what you believe about salvation. 
I don't know what you believe about the eternal security of the believer. You know, we Baptists sometimes are, are castigated because of our, our belief that once you're saved, you're always saved. Well, if you can tell me what eternal salvation means, if it doesn't mean eternal salvation, then I might change my mind. But eternal salvation means that when we are saved, we do not get probationary salvation. We get eternal salvation. We don't get temporary salvation. We get eternal salvation. We don't get hope so salvation. We get no so salvation. It is eternal salvation. Now, sweet people, listen to this. There's only one kind of salvation in the Bible. And that is eternal salvation. Boy, I sure do love our high priest. Seated at the right hand of God. He's able to identify with my sufferings. He's able to identify with my proclivities. Our great high priest extends grace and mercy and eternal salvation. Now look at verse 10. Jesus was called of God to be a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Everything about Jesus is wrong. Why should Jesus be a high priest? He's, he, he's not of the tribe of Levi. He's not a descendant of Aaron. Why should Jesus be a high priest? Because God made him one. We try to put God in a box. We, 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 we are conditioned to believe that A plus B always equals C. Let me tell you this morning, except where God is concerned, a plus B plus C always equals D, except where God is concerned. Here's what you can't figure in. You can't figure in the God factor. And the God factor was this. I'm going to make Jesus a priest after the order of Melchizedek. His daddy wasn't a priest. His daddy wasn't a king. And just like Melchizedek, I'm calling him sovereignly, specially, to be a high priest. What does all of that mean to us this morning? How is this going to help us tomorrow? First and foremost, what it means is, because of who Jesus is, and because of what Jesus did, you can be saved this morning. You may be a member of a church, you may have done religious stuff. That's not salvation. Salvation is in a person, and that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, if you're a child of God, what this means is that when, when the burden is too heavy, the fire is too hot, the road is too long, what that means is you have someone at the right hand of God who is interceding for you. You're never alone. You ever been so hurt, so burdened, that when you prayed, all that would come out was tears, inaudible. You just couldn't find the words. Well, I want to tell you this morning, he understands your tears. And he's interceding for you. See, he knows your heart. He knows who you are and what you are. And he is interceding for you. Rely on him. Rest in our great high priest. As we stand together this morning, prepare for our invitation. Maybe this morning you need to cast your burdens upon the Lord. Unrid yourself of burdens. Maybe this morning you need to depend upon Jesus more. This morning, if you've never been saved, we invite you to come to the saving knowledge of Christ. Salvation is not in a church, it's not in a religion, it's not in a religious act. Salvation is in Jesus. Jesus only.